One of the most common questions that get asked within the UK BF community, one of the most common challenges that people have when they start running their own business is keeping their accounts in order, getting their invoices out on time, chasing up their bills, getting paid on time. And to do that, you need good accounting software. And that's why I'm really pleased to announce that this podcast is sponsored by Free Agent. Free Agent is used by over 150,000 small businesses in the UK, multiple award winning, but not just that, I use it within my own business and own family. It's used by my daughter, it's used by my wife. Click the link in the description to get your first month free, followed by six months at half price for freeagent.com. At that age, I was more interested in having a job that sounded impressive. I was more interested in a job that I thought would impress the girls if I went to a nightclub, things like that. I didn't realise what the stereotype of an accountant was. Seriously, I, I had no idea. So it wasn't easy, um, but on the flip sides, I don't like people saying no to me. I bought a BMW on HP, bought a three-piece suit, all of the stuff, all of the trimmings that you expect from somebody who's a so-called business advisor. Carl, good to meet you. Hey, and you. Good. Uh, thank you for coming in and thank you for agreeing to take part in Drive Podcast. The, uh, as I was sort of having a look through what you've done, which is a hell of a lot, particularly over the recent years, the one thing that jumped out when comparing and sort of looking at your career history is you originally left school early on um, to go into hairdressing. Yeah, it didn't work out, did it? No, no. And um, it was sort of quite left field uh, that I look at. So during that time, of, uh, towards the end of your school life, uh, what was that environment like and decision-making process that led you to finish school relatively early, before your GCSEs, it appeared, from what I can make out, and take a training career in hairdressing? So Richard, you presume that there's a decision-making process so look, I'm going to go back to the start and I'm not going to go as far as being held up by, my, by the midwife by my feet, but let's, let's go back to the start. So I was really fortunate when I was younger, but I didn't realise how fortunate in that I was able to go to a grammar school. So, yeah, as you can imagine, you know, the area where I grew up, it wasn't the best of areas and I got this great opportunity in front of me to become... Uh, you know, an academic superstar, Oxford, Cambridge, etc., etc., and I basically didn't appreciate how how much of an opportunity in life that was. So there was a real disconnect between me and the education system, which I now know was partly down to ADHD. But I just found that I didn't get on with school. I was um, I was disruptive, and you could see my uh, reports just sliding downhill. So. At about the age of 15 and a half-ish, I um, got the National Insurance Card. If you remember the old-fashioned yeah, National yeah. Insurance Cards that come through. Still got one of them. Yep. So I, I, I've got it somewhere, I'm sure. But that was the point where I thought, right, I can get a job. Yeah. You know, I can get on someone's payroll. I can start earning some money. Um, if you bear in mind back to being 15, I don't know what you was up to when you were 15. But mm. for me, I was at an all-boys school. And I wanted to be hanging around with mates. I wanted to be... Um, having more money to go out to the nightclubs, pretending I was older. Um, you know, I look old for my age now. I look really old for my age back then. Um, and, you know, I just wanted to start living the life of people a few years older than me. Because of the disconnect at school as well, they weren't exactly too upset about me not being at school either. So I left before my 16th birthday to start a YTS in hairdressing. Yeah. And again, to pardon my pun, wasn't cut out for it. Um, finished <laughs> within six weeks went back, did my GCSEs, um, but as the, I, I guess the naughty kid who came back to school in their own clothes rather than school blazer and so on. But yeah, school wasn't for me, so I had to find something to do. So that's the story behind the hairdressing. I would love to bore you with stories about how I scaled the hairdressing business and so on, but yeah, I stopped after six weeks and I blame it on dermatitis on my hands. The, uh, the without the dermatitis, I uh, have eczema, but not the yeah, dermatitis. Yeah. The, um, I went onto a YTS scheme and yep. when I got my national insurance card, I applied at a warehouse to do what was, they called it a caller. So sure. basically uh, in a wholesaler, before you had scanners and things like that, my job there was picking up boxes, reading out an eight digit code off it, putting it on the next crate as the retail owners were buying their stock. As soon as I got my um, 
That's an insurance yep. card. And, and it's then, slave labour, <clears> isn't it? Yes. So I was earning, I think it was £31.50 a week at the time. Which was loads of money at that time. For uh, I, 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 I won't go that far. <laughs> this was 1997. It weren't, it weren't loads of money. But um, I remember I was working Monday through to Saturday and you were supposed to have a day off. But it just so happened the day off was the day with the least hours. It was a hairdresser. She'd be working in the evenings. And yeah, I it was... just made me feel really old because mine was like in the nine. 1990, 90, uh, not 89, 90, 91 right. at the time. So when I was, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but no, it was um, it was loads of sweeping up hair, mixing hair dye and so on. I soaked three or four old ladies, but I didn't tuck the towels in properly. Yeah, it just wasn't it wasn't wasn't right for me. So you made the decision then to go back to school and do your GCSE. Yeah, so I didn't go back to school, but um, went in to do the GCSE exams. Right, yeah, and the. Did, was that a conscious decision to do the exams, or was it more of a case of you had to do them? Had to do them. Had, had to, to do them. them. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then you, your first job was in accountancy. Yeah. So um, that happened in December '97. So obviously these things were a bit blurry on timings <laughs> and so on. But um, I remember around the time of Princess Diana passing away. Obviously that's a pivotal moment, but we all remember where we were. Yeah. Um, I was working in a supermarket at that point. Yeah. So. I seem to remember, and again, could be could be wrong on the order of this, uh, but I seem to remember I started at college. Um, so yeah, did the sort of six weeks off, messing around as always. Decided to go to college, oh. and that lasted about two or three weeks. Yeah. Um, and this isn't the typical university dropout story that everyone says. It was a case of um, going to college, started doing GMVQ business, I think it was, and again, that must have been a crystal ball moment, working out that I was going to be in the business world somehow, um, but found it really boring. Um, then, for some reason, I found that boring, so I transferred after about a week or so to A-levels. <laughs> yeah, I have no idea. And then just realised it weren't for me. So I started working at a supermarket, and in fruit and vegetable department, it's amazing. You could eat grapes and all sorts. Um, this was all around the time. I don't know exactly which came first, college or supermarket, but anyway... Uh, but I got to a point fairly quickly where I had to get a proper job. So I was in a um, I was in a relationship at that point and needed to start settling down and doing something for myself. And I remember the um, the supermarket was paying me something like two pound twelve an hour. And when I eventually got my job offer through, it was actually the hourly rate was less than the supermarket, believe it or not. So uh, yeah, we said, we talk about how money changes. It was. I think it was five grand a year that I got for my first job offer. Um, but the choice to go into accountancy, again, wasn't a decision. So just to be completely open about this, and I know that I'm going to sound really naive, and some people who perhaps might have gone through the school and the education system really wanting to be a lawyer or an accountant or whatever, I had no idea what this stuff was. So um, again, I, I mentioned I grew up in a quite, quite a humble area, I think it's the best way of putting it, and I had no idea what a business was, I had no idea what accountants were, I had no idea what tax was. Um, this stuff just didn't hit my radar when I was growing up. So I applied for every job in the newspaper, again, dating me perfectly as being quite old, and applied for three jobs in the paper. Um, so two at accountancy firms and one in the army. Believe it or not, I was underweight for the army at the time. No idea how that worked out, but I was <laughs> underweight. But I actually got offered for two accountancy jobs. And I remember quite clearly, before the first interview, I, um, I went to the library in Leon C, and I was just going through these um, big career books, finding out what an accountant, what, you know, what they did, and about chartered accountancy and was so on. Was this before or after you'd applied? Uh, this was the, the morning of the interview. Yeah. So the interview was, um, I, I don't know if any of the viewers or listeners of this podcast would know Leon C very well, but lovely seaside resort near Southend, which is where I grew up. Um, you've basically got the office in the like the, the biggest office in the um, central point of the town. Next to it, you've got this beautiful old library. So I went to the library, and this was literally, I arrived an hour early, I had time to burn. So I went there and started reading about who an accountant is, what is this job I'm going for, and then just regurgitated it in the interview. And yeah, that, that was what got me into accountancy. But I still didn't know when I was turning up for my first day of work really what it was all about. No, the um, I'm loving this because the um, we absolutely talk about neurodiversity 
throughout this conversation because it's something we both share um, mm. in more ways than yeah. one. Um, and I mentioned earlier, I started on a YTS scheme. Yeah. But my first job, I actually got my first proper job, was in computer-aided design. Right. Um, and I didn't know what that was. Uh, I went to the interview, and they were talking, and it was basically, do you like computers? Yeah, you like computers. Okay, do, do this. It was a YTS. Sure. Scheme. And I went and got a book about that thick on AutoCAD, <clears throat> how to use it, which was the software used. And I literally read that book cover to cover. With I didn't own a computer uh, capable or even like being able to do it. So I had to memorize everything about what computer aided design was. Yeah. So that when I turned up for work on my first day, I was then in front of a computer for the first time and, and was just trying to mem remember, right? Remember okay, how to piece those bits of a jigsaw together. Yeah, and, uh, and start to put it together. And fortunately, quite quickly on, I was doing three dimensional drawings and things that the company had never done. But Amazing. it was that um, ability and need to just take a job and yeah. then I'll work it out when I go along and I will read uh, what I need to do of what that job entails. And this, this was one of the challenges because I needed the job and I'm sure we'll come on to that as a bit of a, a sideways tangent in a moment. So I needed the job yeah. and I had no idea. So first of all, I wasn't as diligent as you. So I didn't, I didn't um, do anything above getting the job. Um, but then I also didn't realise that with what I now know is ADHD, that being an accountant and adding up a page of numbers wasn't the most suitable job. So if I'd be honest, and again, listeners are going to probably wet themselves up and think, how naive is this bloke? Um, at that age, I was more interested in having a job that sounded impressive. I was more interested in a job that I thought would impress the girls if I went to a nightclub, things like that. I didn't realise what the stereotype of an accountant was. Seriously, I, I had no idea. <laughs> But people would think, yeah, when you say the word accountant, most people would think... Glaze over. Yeah, most people would think, you know, um, probably 60 or 70, glasses, grey suit, grey tie, grey briefcase, grey everything. I had no idea. I thought that it's in finance, it's got to be great. And I've seen these people a few years older than me going into the city and doing stockbroking and so on. I had no idea of the reality of what I was letting myself in for. So, um, so yeah, but the, the need for the job that I mentioned there... I started quite early in life in all respects. So obviously leaving school early, um, but also was in a relationship and um, I had my first child very early as well. So I was, and again, it's quite blurry as to the exact timings of this stuff. Um, I think it was after I started the job, but moved out into a bed set and had to start paying bills and so on. And then very quickly had to mature into being a father as well. Yeah. And how... Um... How, how do you find that then? Because the your um, your very your mind's running at like 150, 200 miles an hour. The you're having to, as you just said, sort of grow up very quickly in that scenario yep. with that responsibility. And you've taken a job you didn't know what you was walking into, but very quickly it's adding up numbers on a spreadsheet. The but you're still in that industry. So, so how, yeah. how did you Re find those, get through those first few Re years and hold it down? Really good question. So uh, first things first, just to put it into context, it weren't spreadsheets, it was on um, manual paper. Okay. So it was writing down numbers, adding them up with a calculator and hoping that it all joins books. up and you're not, yeah, you're not a few pence out. So um, how do I hold it down? First, first of all, what I would say is the, the job, because it was a job at that point, it weren't a career. The job was a way for me to fund, um, to begin with a bit of a lifestyle, but obviously five and a half grand, yeah, back then weren't much money. Yeah. It was um, it was to fund a bit of a life. It was to pay for the bed set, et cetera, et cetera. Um, what I would also say was it kind of kept me, I, I wouldn't say I'm straight now, I wasn't like horrifically naughty or anything like that, but I had tendencies to sway off course and, and so on. So it helped be a bit of a grounding point. But I found that the job itself, so the actual role of being an accountant, was to me just incompatible with who I was. Yeah. So I, I basically, along the way, both in my first job and then to DT, which is a firm I moved to and then ended up buying out, I ended up carving out my own role. So back in Essex, um, it was a company called um, RA Smith and Co. 
It was a really traditional accountant. So There's probably about eight or nine people there. Um, I carved out a role of very quickly stopping doing the accounts. I actually stopped doing my training after about a year and a half because I realized I didn't enjoy it. And started going out to um, meet the business owners and help them understand how they could look after their books. And then when I moved to d and I then carved out a completely different role, but again, away from doing accountancy. So I'm not afraid to say that I'm probably the world's worst accountant. So despite having the qualifications, I've probably only actually done on the tools maybe two years max. Um, most of the time has been spent um, either supporting a business doing accountancy or building a business doing accountancy. Okay. The... Um... Picking up on that point when you moved to D&T then, mm. the, you, around about that sort of time you started, uh, you said funding other parts and moving in, um, asking very carefully because I hear you do Taekwondo. <laughs> I, I don't, I don't, that's yeah. a long story together. No, so um, you started sort of p picking up and keeping yourself busy in other areas as well. Yeah, yeah. so one of the things that really struck me when I went for a job interview for that job, so that's when I was 21, 22, was the fact that there was a real, um, I guess, alignment in view between me and the business of what an accountancy firm should be doing for their clients. I mean, it was all about speaking to clients and so on. And I remember you know, really clearly thinking, yeah, this is a place for me. Now, I've, I've not been to many job interviews in my life. So I had my um, job interviews back when I was 16, I and mean, then this one was a bit of a formality because I kind of walked into the role due to uh, various circumstances. I knew people there and so on. So um, it was it was a real eye opener that, you know what, this is a place that could work for me. It will allow me to carve out my own role, do what I want to do. And again, I had to start by doing a year's worth of on the tools as I had to at the last one before they realized that I was absolutely correct when I was saying that I was a world's worst accountant. But I was able to, um, to start doing what I wanted to do, which was basically what I was doing in Essex, but on steroids. So going out, meeting business owners and so on. But what I really enjoyed was going out and not, not training them on you know, how to keep their books, but just speaking to them about their business. Because I had the beauty of the naivety of youth. Um, even though at the time I you know, was as bald as I am now, so I looked, you know, I was early 20s but I looked like I was in my 30s or 40s so that kind of helped I bought a BMW on HP bought a three-piece suit all of the stuff all of the trimmings that you expect from somebody who's a so-called business advisor and then went out met these businesses and with the naivety of youth I was quite happy to just ask one really simple question why so when they were telling me what they were doing and yeah let, let's say the off license who was talking about where they buy their goods from. And so I'd say, why? Why do you go there? Why don't you buy it from Sainsbury's where it's cheaper? And then I'd learn the obvious business lessons of, well, you can't get the volume from Sainsbury's. If you try and go with a, um, yeah, you try and take a trolley through that's full of their discount cans of Coke, mm -hmm. they're not going to let you buy it. So over time, I started to learn the real world of business. And then having those conversations time and time and time again, was ultimately where I sort of got the grounding of how businesses work. Alongside that, what I realized was I really enjoyed selling to people as well, but I didn't really think of it as selling. So you mentioned about Taekwondo. I, um, so I've never done martial arts in my life. And there is a reason for that, because I know quite a few people in that world, and I wouldn't want to embarrass myself um, <laughs> or them with my lack of coordination and flexibility <laughs> and so on. I mean, at my age now, I'm sure it's completely expected, but when I was younger, um, I got to know a lot of that world very early on, and they would have expected me to be quite fit and healthy, and I really wasn't. But we had a bunch of martial arts clients that was gifted to me. Now, I say gifted, it was kind of like, you can deal with these guys. You know, no one else wants to deal with them. So I took them on, and it was about, I don't know, about 10, 15, 20 clients, and I built that up to a client base of 250 just by going out, meeting them, getting to know them. You know, they were blokes like me. They, yeah. you know, likewise, they'd grown up on a council estate. They had, um, you know, they didn't really know what they were doing in business. They were, you know, the average one would have been about five, ten years older than me at the time. So these were individuals? Individuals really? running their own businesses, and I just gelled with them yeah. and got to know about them, their families, what they were doing, why they were passionate about this stuff, 
and then in turn that um, that knowledge and experience what I was able to do was take what was working in one business and just advise it to the other over time they would then recommend me to mates and say built it up to 250 and yeah that was that was really the start of me realizing that there was so much more to um, to running and building a business than doing the stuff because obviously before that I had always expected that you had to be a really good accountant or you know, if you're running an architect's business, you have to be a really good architect or you're a dentist, you've got to be a really good dentist. Now, you hope all of those are really good, but I realised that actually there's so much more to it to actually get pounds in the bank. Um, so, yeah, that was the, the martial arts side of things, which kind of, I guess, gave me a platform to then do stuff. So the just summarising and running through that, because at this point in time, you're still young. Yeah. Um, naive in many ways but learning a lot very quickly and during a period of time as I remember it as well um, accountancy was a very traditional yeah uh, well, it still is let's just let's just strike off all the <laughs> all the rubbish out there there's a lot of um, veneer out there yeah. but it's changing it's not it is still very traditional it's still very boring it's still accountancy but what you what I'm seeing that you're doing during this time is embracing a, um, a different way of thinking that you have um, in a traditional industry where you're li just going out there, you are speaking to people, you're gaining knowledge from there, you're building up these relationships. Through building up those relationships, you're building up a wider client base. I'm making an assumption that the firm you're working at have the support infrastructure behind you to service those customers but effectively what you're doing as well by working, building and being responsible for this growing network of clients is you're also building up your profile and your salary and yeah. your income so and ultimate wealth. Kind of, kind of. So um, during that time, what I'd say, so there was another bit as well as the, um, the conversations, and that is these martial artists were really into personal development. So I was seeing that they had tapes on their, um, you know, on the side of their office or on the seat of their car from these really strangely named Americans, you know, like Brian Tracy, Jim Rohn, Zig Ziglar and so on. So as I was going up and down the country, I started listening to the tapes and CDs and trying to... Just to explain to some of the younger listeners, a tape is a little box a cassette. you yes. put inside of a, <laughs> a music playing device. That plays the old-fashioned version of Spotify. That's exactly and, right. And yeah, so I'd listen to these audiobooks and um, learn a bit about, and I had my eyes open to the whole world of personal development because, again, I was very much of a mind, but my education stopped when I left school. Mm. But that helped me um, understand that there was more of education than just school, college, university, and then a professional education. There was there was more to it. So that that formed part of it. Um, but yeah, look, I I kind of did this stuff, and and what I realised was, so my salary actually didn't shoot up, and I was really naive again. I was quite a risk taker when I was younger. Um, I guess many people will say I still am. Uh, by the age of twenty two, twenty three ish, and again, uh, without doing the maths, you know, twenty two. By the age of 22, I was married for the second time and then had kids, etc., etc. So um, there's, there's quite a journey personally as well. Um, but at 22, 23-ish, I decided to go effectively onto a commission-only basis. Um, I had that level of conviction that I could build this stuff, that I wasn't an employee. And yeah, there were some months that were really bad, some months that were amazing. This was at D&T? This was at D&T. Yeah. So... What, what was happening, I could see that there was the bones of something really special with what I was doing in terms of the ability. Again, this sounds really big-headed, but like that, get new clients. Um, I knew I could build it. And I saw that you had a very traditional business model where partners had clients and so on. And here was me, the uh, least, certainly the least experienced in terms of doing accountant, accountancy. Um, because by 2005, I had the qualification. But I was the least experienced on the tools. But I was winning clients left, right and centre. And before long, I had more clients than the other partners combined. So I knew that I was on to something quite special. Why do you think that is? I, I, I think there's loads of reasons, um, some of which I'll share, some of which I won't share, because obviously, yeah, but everybody's different and everybody has their own way of approaching things. Right. But for me, what I, what I, um, 
I guess identified as the important part of a business advisor is it's actually not about how much you know, it's about how much you care. Now that's the old quote from, I think it's Benjamin Franklin possibly, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care, but also how you can translate things into plain English. And what I saw was, and this wasn't just within sort of my own business, but this was across the board, was that people who advise businesses often like to make the problem bigger and scarier and then use really big words to show how clever they are and how they can fix it. And actually, that's not what a business owner wants. A business owner just wants to be able to sleep at night. Yeah. And people lose sight of that sometimes. So I think it was the ability just to be a calming influence on the business owners, but also the fact that I... I far more naturally align towards a salesman marketer personality. And when I say marketer, I mean creative marketer rather than data driven back office marketing manager. I, I, I'm much more that way inclined than the detail and the diligence that's needed to be an accountant. The, um, I'd agree with that as a, a sentiment overall in that if I think back to my very first accountant, it was very... I almost felt small mm. dealing with the dealing with the accountant, where having somebody who was more um, peer on my level would have made me feel so much more comfortable. And if they literally just broke things down and said, "Yeah, just that, that's fine." That what that basically means is this, yeah, that this, um, rather than oh yes, yeah, so no, I will deal with that, yeah. <clears throat> um, is a much more personal approach. And I can see would pick up clients a lot quicker. Yeah, and I, and I also noticed something. So um, again, I mentioned that when I moved to DNT, I realised in the um, sort of first conversation that they were different and we were aligned with it. And one of the things I did was shadow one of the partners in their meetings, and he would sit down, and there was no talk about the accounts at all. Okay, nothing. Yeah, it wasn't about the meeting. wasn't about tax or anything like that. He would just say, "Oh, so what's your goals for next year?" and then just start talking about the business. And this was like, wow, you can do this stuff. Because I'd never been in those kind of meetings before. Um, but he completely undermined himself because he'd always walk into the meeting with a analysis pad, which is the grid paper for accountants mm. used to use to do the numbers, and a calculator. So I just did what he did, but without the accountant's merch, yeah. sat down, and when I met, met a business owner, it was just about, you know, well, what's success for you? Yeah, where's your business at now? Where do you want it to be? And then just from there, exploring things like their limiting factors, you know, what's holding them back, um, whether it's sort of up here in their mind or whether it's um, an actual reality in their business, find out the blockages, talk it through. We wouldn't talk anything about their tax bill or their profit. We would just talk about what they, what steps they needed to do. They would answer their own questions. You know, it's really important the answers came from them, not from me. Coaching 101. This is it, but the, but the questions were in such a way that to help them, facil or to help facilitate that thinking for them, and then at the end of it, I said, oh, you're an amazing cat. I was like, no, I, I, I've not done anything for you apart from ask the right questions. So I think that was a part of it, but I think there's a whole host of things that come into it that, that was the reason behind why that grew. Do you, um, no, it's really... Um, thinking of the world during that time for DNT and the partners at the time, do you think or do you know that they understood you thought differently during that time? Um, and I choose the term thought differently because um, neurodiversity wasn't even a thing yeah. back in that period of time. Um, so, did they, do you know they did, or do you think they? appreciated and respected that you thought differently to give you that opportunity at such a young age to shape out your own career and because uh, the business clearly benefited mm. so much for it by embracing what we today know as neurodiversity um, was it a conscious decision on their part did they just see something in you and was just like we need to give this person the freedom to go so really good question I, and honestly I don't know I, I can't answer that. So I didn't know myself that I had ADHD until I was about 28, 29. And I was probably one of the first people to be on that kind of path because um, I think ADHD was known before then, but it certainly wasn't an abbreviation I knew. And 
I bumped into someone I knew outside my offices and he's um you know he's a client he's a fellow business owner etc etc and we were just talking he said um I've been diagnosed as ADHD and you need to get diagnosed because if I am you bloody well are <laughs> yeah that was his words yeah. and I kind of like rolled my eyes at it but I was having some challenges outside of work at that time so I um went to the doctors the doctor confirmed that it was looking likely at that point and that they said they couldn't do the formal diagnosis they didn't tell me how to get a formal diagnosis at that point they said you know confirmed um you know we think you are given because i gave them all the internet tests you know how it is when you yeah, yeah. when you think you've got something you go on the internet you search it and you end up with cancer uh, this time i ended up with adhd um but when it's like i'm I, on these tests i'm looking like i've got 10 out of 10 and a gold star um so yeah that was when i kind of knew that i had it but you're right, it wasn't something that would be front of mind or even back of mind as it is now. It just, it was the unknown at that point. Yeah. So did they know that there was some neurodiversity at play? I think they just thought I was a little bit odd. I didn't know there's any neurodiversity at play. I had no idea what it was. I had no idea what, you know, I had no idea that neurodiversity was a thing. I had no idea ADHD, autism, et cetera, et cetera, were things that people could be. I mean, this sounds really offensive, but when I think back, um, you know, when I was younger, you would think of people as just being a bit slow. Yeah, you know, that was the um, terminology that was used yeah. back then. And I think back and think, well, actually, that could have been dyslexia, neurodiversity. It could, it could yeah. have been a whole host of things, but we didn't compartmentalise people into um, a definition because those definitions weren't known. Um, so I might well have been defined in some way by them. Yeah. But I just don't know. I think whether they consciously understood, did or not, the the proof in the pudding in the sense that you was given that room to grow and going back to what my statement a moment ago is the business clearly benefited from it because they clearly got a much broader range of clients um, to sort of grow and move the business forward. Yeah, but, but, but weren't without its challenges though because it was a uncomfortable relationship. Yeah. So what you've got to remember is the traditional accountants had a view of how a traditional accountant should be. So a good example is when the management buyout kicked off, I was told in no uncertain terms that I can't be part of it until I was 30. Right. Even though I started the process at 26, we did all the agreement of evaluations and so on, but we couldn't do the deal until I turned 30 because apparently clients would expect you to be that age to be a partner in an accounting firm. Um, there was also uh, there was a hell of a lot of conflict with one of the partners who just didn't get where my vision was. It was totally different to his vision and his experiences of being an accountant. So, so it wasn't easy. Um, but on the flip side, I don't like people saying no to me. So I just I just do it anyway. And I'm a big subscriber of um, asking for forgiveness rather than permission. So I just cracked on, and it was kind of tolerated on both sides. So when um, there's a four-year window there, yeah. so the MBO, Management Buyout, commenced when he was 26. Yes. It was actually delayed for four years or delayed completing four years for you to be part of it at age 30? Yes. So that was what I was told. Now, bear in mind, I wasn't the driving force behind that MBO. No. Um, I think there would have been other factors at play. Probably the founding partners, the time and age would have been part of it, you know, when he wants to drop off and so on. But yeah, there was a whole host of reasons why that was a long process. Um, but that long process actually gave me a good amount of time to really ramp up that business during that time as well and prepared us for what came shortly afterwards. So during those four years, that was when I was head down, growing the business, and from 2007, and that's where we really doubled down in the franchising world, built our reputation there. And it was all... In that four-year window. In that four-year window, yeah. yeah. So I, it was a punt at first. Yeah, you know, we had some martial arts schools, but we're looking to franchise. I went to the franchising shows with them in 2006, met a few people, just kept turning up. And then over time, we started working with loads of household brands. So um, that was the time where I was really on the tools in terms of driving the business in terms of sales, in terms of marketing, and getting to the point where I could actually step back from some of this stuff and have other people do it for me. That, 
that leads into some of the questions I've got about how you go into and finance an MBO. Of course. Because you've got um, sort of rolling back a little bit. So you, you know, come from humble beginnings and you said that like, your first step into work is funding a bed sit. Yeah. Uh, the, you're still in your mid twenties, uh, approaching buying your employer with a group of other people yeah. within there. The, how do you even go about approaching to buy a company in such a short space of time? Not in the way I did. <laughs> <laughs> so look, I was really fortunate that I was able to, I guess, um, use the momentum of the growth of the business and the direction in which I was going as a good proportion of the, I guess, sweat equity. Um, my business partner now, Ben, he, um, he was able, you know, he, he's very internally focused. So, you know, we, we use the rocket fuel and traction methodology from Gino Whitman. Fantastic books if you haven't read them, but they set out the way that you can run a company. But one of the um, suggestions is that there's a partnership in every company. There's the visionary and the integrator. Ben is the stereotypical integrator. Very pessimistic, very internally focused, very detail and operationally driven. I'm very much the big picture thinker, come up with loads of ideas. Again, sits with where I sit from a neurodiversity perspective. So um, Ben was fortunate enough to have um, access to funds uh, through his background. He, he couldn't have had a more different upbringing from me. Yeah. You know, um, He probably would laugh if he hears this because it is actually untrue. But my little flat in the block of flats where I grew up like when I was a kid, um, his house was probably bigger than the block of flats. So that's kind of the, the chalk and cheese from that side of yeah. things. Yeah, he was private school, so on. I was the kid who got really lucky, got into grammar school, but was the only council estate kid in grammar school. So we had very, very different life experiences up to that point, but he was able to bring some money to the table. But the MBO itself, um, there was actually two MBOs in short succession. And that's important because they were both done in very different ways. The first one was a combination of the money coming in from Ben, a vendor loan where we paid off <laughs> over time. And um, we were advised at the time that the best way to fund it was through an overdraft. Okay. Yeah, you're rolling your eyes. And I yeah. agree completely because it really wasn't the best way. But we had our projections. We had an overdraft facility to um, help when the vendor loan payment started to buy it. And we did that. What we didn't plan for was the second MBO which was down to some external challenges with um, the other partner who was part of a first MBO. And we got to a point where without, you know, without saying too much on this, um, for obvious reasons, we had to take the shares back and then work out how to fund the situation that we were left in. So, um, so that one was very different. But both of them, if I was to design an ideal MBO, not how I would do it. Right. So yeah, the first one was a um, a cash flow funded MBO, but with an overdraft. The second one was a backwards MBO where we took the shares and then worked out what we're going to do. So, with hindsight, what would be your ideal uh, MBO structure? <laughs> uh, speak speak to a bank, speak to um, lending institutions, tell them what you're doing, get the funding based on the value of what you're buying. Yeah, you know, what ninety nine point nine 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 percent of the <laughs> advice out there would be. Um, yeah, we. It wasn't a deliberate choice. The, uh, one of the most common issues when uh, small business owners who have gone into some form of partnership come onto UKBF and go, hell, is where um, they do have uh, relationship challenges with their business partner. So quite often it could even be a family member. Yeah. The, you've alluded to something there. Um, first question really is, would you say that, oh, well, no, first different first question did you have like a partnership agreement shareholder agreement or something like that <laughs> what, okay, do, you think? what do you think <laughs> so so okay so presumably not um so that probably led to the situation where it was a knee-jerk reaction to try and a, a sort of a, a not knee-jerk wrong choice of words but a uh, reactive way of handling the situation yeah so um so what had happened uh, between the point of the first MBO and the second MBO was that in the business we um, 
we knew that you know, the shackles were free, the traditional partner was gone, we were able to really drive forward the modern firm that we thought we were. Yeah. Um, but yeah, there was a whole host of personal challenges for one of the partners and expensive habits and so on that had to be extracted from the business. So oh, even with the best planning in the world, we never would have foreseen, you know, it's a bit like a, yeah. a COVID situation, but it's something completely external, completely out of control that suddenly landed on our doorstep. And yeah, we've actually we've, seen scenarios like this specifically on uh, UKBF where people have had completely. Yeah. And yeah, money uh, supposed to be in the bank, not in the bank. What do yeah. we do? So that one was kind of accidental. But yeah, going back to the bigger picture of partnerships and how they work, I mean, what you need to remember is Ben and I, we were from such different backgrounds, such different ways of thinking. There would be no reason at all that we would have come into each other's worlds, apart from the fact that we happened to be in the same office working for the same company. So there was a load of tension and we were kind of forced through the MBOs to work out how to work together. Because well, that works fantastic. I'm I'm a massive advocate of surrounding myself with people who think differently and disagree with me. I use the expression mm. disagree with me intentionally, but not not argumentatively. Yes. Because you get more productivity and you learn more for getting to the right solution by people challenging you, especially if Definitely. you're visionary, you're the you you can have so many ideas, what you actually need is somebody to pick those ideas apart or see the obstacles in them. Um, because when you're so in the thick of it, you just see the positive, you just think you do. Work. And I think that we've realized that now, but it took us a long time to get to that beyond the MBOs. Yeah. So what would happen was that the team would see the differences between us. So you'd have people going to mum or dad based on what answer they wanted. So if somebody wanted a prudent, hesitant, let's not risk something, they would go to Ben. If they wanted an optimistic answer, yeah, go on, give it a go, they'd go to me. So that was challenging. Um, but also, yeah, there was a general feeling, I think from both of us, that one was trying to put the brakes on, one was trying to put the accelerator on. And obviously I wanted the brakes to be taken off and Ben wanted the accelerator to be let up a little bit. So there was those constant battles and we managed to turn them into quite a productive relationship, but we were only able to do that. And again, I'm not trying to be overly promoting this book, um, but Rocket Fuel by Gino Wickman, when he talked about these two roles in a business and he talked about the likes of Disney and Apple and all of these companies, but have somebody who's kind of like the front face, but actually there's somebody who's on an equal footing. You know, they might be employed, they might have less share, whatever, forget all of that, but they're on an equal footing in terms of authority in the business yeah. and everything from the visionary has to go to the integrator, but then the integrator has to drive it forwards. As soon as we, we got that, we got that concept and we started to look at the language we were using and the, um, the ways we question each other and then in turn, the way that we, I, I guess, um, implement this stuff in our businesses and the the structure to the meetings and the fact that he leads them, not me. You know, I, I love the sound of my own voice, but actually I just don't go to the meetings. I let him run them. As soon as we got that smoothed out, then all of a sudden it's like, yeah, this is the perfect partnership because we're getting a hundred ideas where most businesses don't even get a single idea each day. We're getting a hundred before breakfast. And then we've got Ben to filter down to three or four that really could work, prioritize them, project manage them and so on. That was when it, the light bulb went on, but actually, yeah, this is a pretty good partnership. But it wouldn't have happened if we weren't forced into that position. And can you uh, can you pinpoint sort of the time when that sort of clicked in place and the difference it made to the business? Yeah, of course. So I first heard of this concept in around 2015, 2016, I imagine. I can't, again, can't guarantee, yeah. but it was in a restaurant. I can remember this stuff. So it was in an Italian restaurant, just in Little Venice, sort of uh, you know, behind Paddington, a little bit further up the canal. Um, I was meeting with two guys that I really trust and know quite well, um, Ainsley and Paul, if you listen to this, you know that it's exactly about you. Um, and I was sharing the challenges we were facing, and I think it was Paul said, I've read this book, you must read it. And then Ainsley said, yeah, I've bought it because I've been told I need it, and I've been told it's really good. So ordered it on Amazon that day, and yeah, that was the moment where I got it. Now, what I didn't know 
was that the book was framed for the visionary to buy. Okay, right. so it blew a lot of smoke up the backside of the visionary, and the tone around the integrator wasn't as positive as the tone around the visionary. Okay, okay. because obviously it's normally the entrepreneur who'd buy this book and I say, "Oh, I need an integrator. I'll go and recruit one." But Ben and I were equal in the business, and in fact, you know, he'd put arguably he'd put the money in. No. Yeah, well, I was up at Swap and he, he he had cold hard cash on the line, so I. You know, in, the, in my usual way, ordered the book off Amazon, but ordered two copies, one to be delivered to him, with a little post it away saying, read this. And he looked at it, and it was like, oh, yeah, the organisation charts and so on beneath me. I was like, oh, my word. So it actually took longer to put into place because he had to get over that emotional hurdle. Mm. And we had to get to a point of how do we make this work for us rather than how do we make it work from a business book that's normally bought by a sole trader or, you know, when somebody's looking to grow their business rather than having an established business. But yeah, that was, it was mid, mid 2010s, but we stumbled across this. Yeah. And, and then how were the next few years like after that? Yeah. So fits and starts. Um, it was a very rigid structure. There was times it worked, there was times it didn't. Um, during that time, so from 2013, I think 2012, 2013, when the second MBO was done, the business was being built by design for me to step away from it as well. So that was when I started writing my books, speaking on stage, all of that kind of fun stuff, which I'm sure we'll come on to in a moment. And um, and yeah, it was part of building that structure to allow me to do that. And yeah, it, you know, as with all of these things, it was sometimes two step forwards, one step back. So we had to just test what worked, go back, fix things. And also, quite honestly, there was stuff in the model that we either didn't see the benefit of initially or we tried but implemented it incorrectly. So it's been a learning journey as well. The, um, let's see, I've got a question here, mm. which I won't ask it in the way I was going to ask now about why write a book, because you've just um, alluded to that now, because I find it quite interesting that you've gone through an MBO, bring, uh, which... In te like brings you deeper into the business sure but the process is to take you out of the business yes um so why why that process why why that ha make that happen well, yeah sure it obviously so, didn't happen because you're still there but why was yeah, that thought process so there? so yeah in terms of where i am today um so i'm serving as chairman of the business but it's a hands-off role yeah. um by the time this is released that might change so watch <laughs> this space but anyway um I guess for me, the what I saw was the ability to create a business that wasn't reliant on any one person. Yeah. yeah, that was the key thing. And I've actually changed my view on that to some extent. But back then, if you remember, the book Even If Revisited by Michael yeah. Gerber was the Bible for everyone. That was what we were doing. And it was all about systemization, the franchisable prototype, turnkey business, all of this stuff that we've, um, we've heard several times over. Now, I don't think that applies today, funnily enough. But back then, the contention that a, a extraordinary business was made from ordinary people and extraordinary systems was correct because if you put that in place, that stood you apart from everybody else. Yeah. I think the world's moved on from that now, but back then, that was kind of the business 101 as to how you improve your business and remove the bottlenecks. So were we talking about removing you from day to day or removing you from business? Uh, so the, remo mind, the mindset of course time. so at that type so to begin with removing from the day to day yeah but then so taking me away from the sales meetings away from creating marketing material and so on um, but then over time removing me completely so that I was just a arm's length board member right. okay so that was the the plan from day one of the MBO was right yeah we're inherently lazy how do we get other people to do this stuff so we built a management team, we invested in consultants to train them up and all of this stuff. And it took longer than expected, but by 2019, I was able to sort of shout from the rooftops that, guys, this is what we've done. I'm not, I'm not involved in any direct sales I'm on the ground. I'm not knocking on doors. I'm not whipping people who are knocking on doors. I'm not even being the one above that who just looks over it all. I'm coming in one day a month and looking at my board pack. So that was the plan, and that was alongside recruiting an MD and you know, getting the executive board in place, all of that stuff. 
Um, that obviously was all well and good until COVID came along. So again, another story, I'm sure. But the process of doing that, what I found was I was able to reduce my commitment to the business over time. And that was what freed me up to write the books and speak on stage and have some fun with the personal brand side of things. Yeah. And the one of the things I picked up on is, uh, again, something you sort of alluded to earlier when you're about fran going to franchise shows, lying with franchises, mm. is you've appear from the outside chosen your niche yes well yeah um how important was that uh so uh, absolutely vital yeah. and you know i think with so with accountancy as a profession there's a lot of dispute over whether you should have a niche or not um, but wider for any business it's really important to know who your customer is um, from a marketing perspective and a service delivery perspective so yeah, if you look at waitrose versus aldi They've both got an avatar of their ideal customer. Yeah, they know who they want, and it's the banding around it who they tend to attract. Um, yeah, that was absolutely vital for us. And I saw the power of niching through the martial arts. So at our peak in martial arts, and we don't look after so many now, but we looked after 250 martial arts schools out of a total market of about 600 in the UK. And I had learned through, um, I, I guess through trial and error, how to totally dominate an industry. And it was really simple. It was getting involved in the governance. It was getting involved in the supply chain. It was becoming the go-to, basically becoming the glue of that world. Yeah. And then franchising was an opportunity we saw. And we didn't really know what, what the opportunity was at first. So as I said, I had a martial arts school. I'm rewinding back now to 2006, to the first expo at the NEC. Um, went with them and I saw that there was a light bulb moment that there's all of these businesses here and yes they've got a legal agreement but there's something that could be done and I didn't quite know what it was we took on our first major network so we'd, we'd taken on some smaller networks you know some of our businesses had started franchising we'd taken on a couple of local ones like a little pet sitting one and so on but they weren't really big name ones and then there was a big VAT case okay complete sort of over here Big VAT case, I thought, hmm, this one could affect this really big franchise. Yeah. I'm going to write a letter to all of their franchisees. Okay. Wrote a letter to all the franchisees saying, we can help you with this VAT case. And it just so happened that pretty much 80% of those letters went to the franchisor, who's now <laughs> sadly passed away, who picked up the phone saying, what bloody hell are you doing? Write to all our franchisees. And we spoke to him, and then we realised that actually there was a service we could offer to head office possibly, to the franchisees, of making sure that they were going to be okay with this BAT case. And then as we did that, we realised actually we've got access to all of their data. We know their business better than anyone else in the world because franchisor hasn't got this data, we've got it. Franchisee only sees what's going on in their location. We see every location. And that was where the, um, the idea, yeah, the penny dropped of what the idea was was that actually we could be that central point. I remember the side product of that, which we didn't strategically aim for at that point, was that it was a hub and spoke relationship. But you look after one person and you get 200 bits of business off of it. And that was the idea. So there was some selection, but we didn't predict the outcome. No, but it, um, it's very, you, you're right what you say. There's sort of two sides of the argument and people have different opinions mm. about whether the you become too niche and then you're closing down your market but if you become niche you become an expert in that field and you become the go-to yeah uh, personally my view is the niche i'm supportive of you know become yes. an expert in a particular field and then you be become credible in that field yeah and i think what, what we need to remember is life's too short yeah yeah life's too short to be everything to everyone and life's too short to work with people you don't want to work with so for me selecting a customer avatar i'd rather say customer avatar rather than niche at this stage because yeah. i think the niche then naturally follows on from it yeah. but if you find that you naturally resonate you know whatever it is you do whether you're selling products or services whether your services are accounting like mine or web design or whatever whatever you do if you've got a certain kind of person where you just gel with them you know and it could be that you create your avatar and it's like i really gel with females aged 45 to 55 who've done the family thing, they're now looking to do X, Y, Z, and even go down so far as what car do they drive, what handbag do they wear, you know, really nail down who it is 
who's the typical person where you see them shoot, you think, I'm going to get on with them. Yeah. Once you've got that, you, you then have that comfort that you're only going to work with and attract people like that and people who are in your comfort zone. And then from there, they will gravitate to certain kinds of lines of work. Um, so again, if, you, if we use an example of, let's say, much younger, and you think that, yeah, the ideal kind of person I want to work with, and not in a perverted way, is the Love Islanders. Let's, let's say that. And yeah. somebody says, right, I really want to work with Love Islanders. Well, you're naturally, your niche industries could well be influencers, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, so yeah, I think that having that avatar helps you identify exactly what you want to be doing, who you're working with, who you can gel with, where your expertise lies, all of this stuff. And it kind of becomes a perfect match. It I think owns your activity. It to does. Really as well. I think where it gets challenging though is a lot of companies use it only for marketing because it has amazing marketing benefits. If you decide on a niche, then you can, uh, you know, you say it hones your activity. I'm going to double down on that to hone your marketing activities. What it does is it then makes you really focus on what are the words that will resonate with them. What is the type of material? Where will they be on social media? What magazines will they read? And that will give you the hit list of where to be and how to talk. But you also need to look at then how you deliver it. How do you tick those boxes of those needs? Yeah. You know, how do you, how do you deliver the service in a way that really addresses a problem rather than it looking like you've got a bit, bit of a veneer, but then you're just a generalist under the surface? Uh, when you get those, both of those nailed, then the marketing's really easy and the clients don't want to leave. Yeah, no, spot on. The, around about 2018, uh, you got really busy. <laughs> so, um, again, uh, I think you've pretty much touched on this now, but I'll ask the question specifically. Um, why was that and what did you move into? Yeah, sure. So, wow, loads of things probably. But yeah. um, so over that time, from 2012 onwards, it was a gradual increase of my time that allowed me to do other stuff. And what I found was I, I started to see a couple of passions of mine coming through, but I didn't know were there and were quite dormant before. So charities were the first thing. Yeah. And I think it was about 2014-ish that I started, what, 2014, 2015 maybe, but I started working with the Trussell Trust. And that was a connection from a um, venture capital guy that I knew. He, he was asked from a fundraising perspective to introduce some people. I went in and I didn't realise, but the Trussell Trust was a franchise. So it was a social franchise, so they used the franchising model for charitable purposes. And the 1,400 food banks, or whatever the number is, they're, they're all effectively franchisees of the head office. So it's all not for profit, but using a franchise relationship to make sure branding's consistent, websites consistent, and so on. So they needed some support on that, and I became a pro bono consultant. Um, then went on to help Buttle, who were a children's poverty charity. Um, part of that was because I remember not having a bed when I was younger, and their key stat that they always tended to use, and they had campaigns with dreams, beds, and so on, was around the number of kids who don't have a bed. So that again fitted really well with me and then Young Enterprise. But um, so charitable activity was probably the first thing I started doing. The second was the writing and I fell into writing by accident, but started with the startup coach in 2015. Um, that was unbelievable for the opportunities that gave me. When I got the book contract, I don't know how I got the book contract. It was with Hodder and Stoughton, who were part of the world's second biggest publisher, I think. And I remember when I was younger, I read Ian Wright's autobiography. And he said that the contract from Arsenal was given to him. And he just signed it. He didn't look at it. And it was like that. It was a real just like, just sign it. I, yeah, I'm going to do this. See, the writing fascinates me because my son has ADHD. And the, the thought of getting him, he's at college, to write. Yeah doesn't lend itself to I, absolutely not no but you get hyper focus kick in and what I found was that the writing was it was really tough and there were days where I'd only do 300 words and there's other days where I'd knock out 12,000 words and you know fueled by uh, caffeine and all sorts to get through it but um but yeah I've kind of found my flow with writing I quite enjoy it as a way of decompressing but what happened with that book? So I had about 900 social media followers when I first did it. And this is where the activity really ramped up. It got picked up on by a guy called Murray Harkin, who was the agent for Martin Lewis at the time. So he was working with the Trussell Trust. Yeah, all of these things kind of come around. 
he was a better PR guy and we started speaking. He said, look, you should be doing a whole lot more than you are at the moment. And that's when a load of the PR stuff came off the back of it. So we had that. I wrote the franchising handbook in, I think that's written in 2015, released in 2016, again with Hodder. But the tipping point for me personally was around Christmas to January 2016. Yeah, so January 2016. So yeah, December 2015, January 2016. Uh, December 2015, things weren't going so well between me and my ex-wife. So we'd split by then, and by that point, I had three kids. So the relationship with my first son was amazing. Um, you know, still is, going to football, etc., etc. Uh, the two kids who I lost access to, uh, so Lauren and Charlie, unfortunately, it was becoming tougher and tougher to keep that up because of things outside of my control. So um, I could see there was writing on the wall of where she was looking to take it and it wasn't good. So I made a decision over Christmas 2015 that I was going to make it so that my name could be found on Google, basically. That was, that was my sole objective. If they go on Google, I want them to see that I'm a good guy and they can find a way to contact me. You know, type my name in, they'll find me. Um, so I started to look at all of this, um, I guess, personal branding stuff, but it wasn't called personal branding back then. You know, everyone's doing it now, but back then it was, um, you know, Gary Vaynerchuk was doing a bit of it, but he was still heavily involved in Wine Library, and I think had just written some of his books. And there was a lady called Sarah Cordoner, who I think has now gone back to doing a job. Um, you know, I don't think she's doing all the personal branding stuff, anymore, but I was... Um, I watched some of these videos and so on, and there was something that really resonated with me. One saying from um, Gary Vaynerchuk, which is, an audience of one is better than an audience of none. So I set myself a challenge in January 2016, which was every day I wanted to get an interview with somebody, whether it's a blogger, podcaster, so on. By the end of January, I had five bits of coverage in the national press. Right? I'd never, never been a PR, never done any of this stuff before, Oh, there's something behind this. I think it was by April, I'd employed, so I had obviously Murray as a publicist, I had a content creator, I had a copywriter for me. I, I started to have like a real team. And these were like full-time employees. It was, it was amazing. And yeah, things just kind of took off from there. And that, that is, I guess, the, the foundations of where I was very busy and visible in sort of 2017, 18 onwards. Um. And we've now, we've just started 2023. Uh, what does the future hold for you? Wow. So, um, lots, of, lots and lots of different stuff floating out there. Yeah. Um, if I just touch on some of that bit from maybe 2018 yeah. onwards, because I think that will give some context to some of the stuff I'm going to talk about afterwards. So when I stepped away fully from DNT, I got really bored really quickly and took over a National League South Football Club which was crazy. So called Hungford Town. Um, so I don't know how well you know the league structure of the UK. I don't but follow football, but I have heard a saying, that if you want to become a millionaire, um, start off as a billionaire and yes. buy a football club. Yes. So we didn't buy it. Hungerford was actually a community-owned club, but it was the certainly there or thereabouts, the highest ranking community club in English football. So it's them and Concord Rangers were the two that were, um, and, you know, they had to swap league places. I think at the moment Concord will be the highest because Hungford aren't doing too well, but we kind of fluctuated. But the league structure in the UK, so you've got the Premiership, yeah. which obviously everybody knows. Then you've got the Championship, which is a really good level. And then you've got League One and League Two, which in reality probably should be part-time, but they're full-time professionals. You then got what in old money was known as the Conference, which I, is I National the League. Conference, yeah. Uh, which is National League, and that's made up of um, National League and then National League North and South. So you've got six levels. Four are full-time professional. Five used to be semi-pro, but is now professional. And then Hungerford were at that sixth level. Okay. So it's a really, whilst Hungerford Town might sound like a really tiny club, they were massively punching above their weight. And by that point, I'd moved to the area, and it was just so happened, one of my, one of my mates had retweeted something, and... A guy called Fraser Digby, who used to be a goalie for um, Swindon Town and Man U and a few others. And, um, and yeah, he retweeted that they were looking for someone. And 
I put, threw my hat in the ring, somebody else threw their hat in the ring. And again, it was, we got together, we talked, you're like, yeah, we can do this together. And we took over. So it wasn't an acquisition, really important to note that because it's a community club and should always be a community club. Um, but yeah, I did that. And that was a amazing learning journey. It showed me the reality of the football world in so many ways. And I learned how to pull a pint. I learned how to run a bar. I learned how to separate um, groups of gobby kids in the crowd and have pint glasses thrown over my head, all of that kind of stuff. Um, I got lumbered with all those kind of jobs. But I had this vision of a football chairman being a really glamorous role. You know, we, anyone listening who's into football... Might be in the Premiership. Exactly. Um, you know, I had this vision that it would be directors, boxes, so on and so forth. I was, I was clearing birds' mess off the stands. It was a real roll your sleeves up, get stuck in. But it was great because it was for the community and really good team. So, so yeah, that was part of the journey. And um, obviously the book Boss It, which I've done most recently and was probably the most high, high profile of my books, um, that was part of it. So there was a load of stuff going on behind the scenes. Um, which kind of led us to where we are today and what's in for the future. And the truth is, Richard, I don't know what I want to be when I grow up. No. I still don't. I still don't know what I want to be when I grow up. Um, so what I see is the world has been totally unsettled over, certainly over the last couple of years, but that disruption and lack of being settled was there for some time. I think COVID just amplified it for us all. And I think that we've all had a realisation during COVID that we've only got one life and our mortality has been brought to the forefront of what we do. An interesting aside to that was my book, Bossit, was very much originally intended to be a business book, basically the startup coach, but done properly. Now I know how to write. Yeah, that, that was what it was intended to be. It was intended to be a more narrative version of startup coach because startup coach was a series book with a defined structure and tone of how it's to be written. Boss it, I was given complete freedom. It was like, you know, just, just get on with it and show us the end product. So I wanted it to be rectifying the stuff I'd done before, but actually people took very different messages from it from the messages I was intending to give. And it ended up being around mindset and all of that kind of stuff. So so yeah, that, that leads me to where, where we are at 2023 and where do things go forwards? Um, We've got big plans across the board, quite frankly. Um, D&T, we've got some ambitious plans because we see huge opportunity within the accountancy space to do things in a different way to how they've been done before. That's not just a tech thing, which uh, most of these plays are. We actually see something a whole lot bigger than that. Um, from a writing perspective, I've not only got book, books four and five, but I've probably got up to book number 15 mapped out and ready to go. Um, speaking has taken off. So I'm, I'm in the luxurious place of having the options in front of me. Um, and when would you have made it? That is a core of a question. <laughs> because I think that you probably notice this on all of your podcasts, that make it, having made it, is an ever-moving feast, isn't it? Yeah. So... What I try to do, I always try to frame thinking back to um, when I was younger. And I'm going to go all motivational quote, and this is all like my, my, where my new content's no, go going, because I'm, I'm trying to become a lot more observant of people and how they think and what motivates them. And the reality is that there's only two people in the world you need to impress, your 21-year-old self and your 80-year-old self. They're the only two people. Now, if we go back to 21-year-old or 18 or 16 or 10, whatever... Whatever one you want. If you go back, then I probably subjectively would have absolutely made it. Yeah, if we, let's say, I don't know, 10 year old self, I'd have subjectively made it by getting a job. Okay? Yeah. Because the estate that I grew up on, there was, you know, I, I knew it weren't right even at that age, but there's people who just didn't work and bad bats and all of that kind of stuff. So to be in a position where I could, um, I mean, obviously I wouldn't have, at that age have known much about buying houses and all, all that stuff, but to be in a position where I'd have a nice new car, for example, all that stuff, that would have been made it. So that would have happened quite quickly in my journey. But the problem we've got is that success 
it changes over time, what your definition of it is, not just in terms of the volume of it, like how much you need, how many pounds in the bank or whatever, but also the makeup of it as well. Because success to, let, let's go to my 21 year old self, where things had started ramping up and I could see opportunity, that would have probably been far more financial than it might be now. Um, obviously there's some humbling experiences along the way that kind of realign your views on what's important. But whatever it is, that stuff is also on a escalator and it's never ending. So you're on the escalator and you reach it, but you don't realize you've reached it because something else has gone on. And I, I think to kind of bring that round um, to, to a lived experience, I had a really sobering moment when I was going through my second divorce. So I'm now married third time, final time. I'll be, I'm yeah. delighted to announce. <laughs> um, but during my second divorce, I... You know, it was during that period that I picked up on the personal development and so on that you remember me mentioning. Yeah. So I was listening to all of these um, you know, cassette tapes, but also reading my books and so on about goal setting. And I had a Moleskine notebook and I wrote down my goals. And my goals were, um, I wasn't afraid to put material goals as well, as well as achievement goals. But there was things like what I wanted to be earning. There was things like, yeah, I wanted Range Rover Sport. I wanted... Um, it's embarrassing looking back at it now. Um, some of this stuff was in fashion back then, went out of fashion and back in fashion, like the CP company jacket. Um, there was the Creed aftershave, church issue, all of that stuff I put in there. And then when my personal life seemed like it was just like a complete mess, it was like completely blurry and so on, I found this book and I looked through it and it was a really like, it was a cold chill coming through me. When I read it, it's like, yeah, I've got all of this stuff. And I was wondering why I felt so empty. So, yeah, it really is. You know, I've had the realisation myself that I'd written this stuff down, committed it to paper. Five years later, I'd achieved it without realising I ticked the goals off. The, um, I, was, I gave a talk at an event once, years and years, many years ago. I was um, going through a phase, I was winning a few awards for mm. a business I used to own at the time. And... At that time, I was winning these technology-based awards, but I didn't have loads of money. Yeah. And the, I think, what kind of, I'd have beaten up Rover 75, I was running around with. And I, um, several years later, we were cleaning up all our IT and I found the speech that I'd wrote. And in there it had, I may not have, uh, and I was talking about family, I, I may not have the Mercedes car or the house, um, um, country house but I feel much richer with my, support my family. So sort of mm. words along those lines. And when I read it, I was like, I actually drove a Mercedes at the time and I did have a, a village house I was yep. happy with. And I was just thinking, this is surreal. Yes. That's exactly that same thing. But it doesn't feel enough, does it? No. And that's the really strange thing. So it is that constantly moving, um, that constantly moving goal. So this is where my personal, um, I, I guess my personal content is coming in now is... I've learned some of this stuff the hard way and some of it through reading books about it where people have told me and I believe them. You know, the stuff I've learned the hard way was where I didn't believe them and had to experience it myself. Yeah. Um, but we're, we're led down a path and I mean, we could unravel a whole few hours of conversation <laughs> around the, um, the lack of role models for men at the moment and the challenges we've got coming in society with, with all of this stuff. But... Um, we are led down certain paths, whichever paths we choose. Uh, and for the kids of today, I feel really sorry for them, but the options are the fake Instagram influencers, you've got the private jet and so on. You know, all of, the, all of the influences that are coming in and trying to work out what's important and acknowledging the wins as well as striving for the next thing is going to be really difficult for the generation coming through. Absolutely. So you, you mentioned earlier then, well, you've just mentioned mm. now that the destination is a constant moving, yeah. uh, constant evolving destination. The, and you said a moment earlier that your purpose to become known was so that your estranged children yeah. um, could find you. Uh, so that was a few years ago. I don't know, what's, you know how things are at the moment. What is your motivation, or to quote the podcast, so what is your drive that keeps driving you towards that continually moving target? Yeah, really good question. So, um, so yeah, in terms of the initial motivation, 
Um, and that was the underlying driver. But I think there's a few factors that come into play. Um, so just to, to round that one off, because I wouldn't suggest that people embark on a personal branding mission just to um, just to tick one box. I saw at that point, you remember I mentioned that the EMIF model is kind of broken. Um, I saw that actually we needed exceptional people and exceptional systems. So it's to put a human face to the brand. So that was one of the aspects. The second one was undoubtedly to tick an ego box. But I liked the sound of my own voice and I wanted to push myself of being heard more and more. Um, and then there was the personal driver behind it. So it was actually a few things that hap happened to happily collide and come into the same place. Um, but what are the goals now? So goals change over time. And obviously that's still a goal is, um, but not, not just for them, it's actually for kids, grandchildren and so on. I would like them to look back and see a bit of a legacy left. Um, but there's also a very specific goal with my youngest son, Junior, who's got some real grave challenges in life. And it's looking like we're going to have to provide a substantial pro financial provision to make sure that he's taken care of down the line. Um, so, yeah, that is, unfortunately, it's a material goal, but it's to make sure that there's enough cash in the bank to pay for carers and so on and so forth. And they don't come cheap. No. So that's a bit of a goal as well. But I think one of the things that I always try and remember to move away from the destination goals, one of the most eye-opening books that I've read, and I struggled to read all of it, but was The Power of Now. I'm sure you might have come across it, Eckhart Tolle. Yeah. And in there, there were some real eye-opening moments, but actually the only point of time that's, that's true and real and that we're in is now. Yeah. And everything behind you is either faded memories and you know happy smiles of what it was and nostalgia or regret and guilt and the future is just opportunities or problems but they just detract you from where you are right now so what i'm trying to do whilst i've got targets to aim for I'm trying to make sure i actually focus on what we've got right now right in front of us that's so true um last part um because um the purpose here was also to, you know, to give insight and help to people who are starting up. If you're stood in front of a young person um, who might be facing uh, mental health challenges or neurodiversity challenges, uh, the what would be your top three piece of advice you would give to that person? Really good question. So. I think that mental health is talked about far more often now, and particularly neurodiversity. I mean, I, I still don't know, and please correct me if I'm being politically incorrect, of separating the two or combining the two. I don't know. It's kind of, we know it's all up here. Yeah, um, yeah we know it's in the head, but I still haven't worked out where, where that sits. So I apologise for any listeners who might be offended by a turn of phrase that I use on this, but... Um, I'll try and share from my own experience rather than any theory or what we're supposed to say. Um, I think the first thing I would say is not to be afraid of seeking help. And I was afraid of seeking help for my ADHD for, well, 13 years. Okay. So when I realised I had ADHD, by that point, I was quite egotistical. And part of that, I, I perhaps falsely correlated what I had done in business and the fact that I'd been able to buy this firm out and now now we were scale at that point I was at the point of scaling it and then I was I had the plan of where I was going to step back. I felt I was unstoppable, I thought I was immortal, but I also felt that I didn't, you know, behind the scenes I didn't want to change anything that could have been the driver of it. Yeah. So I see a lot of people now, and this is not to attack them but who wear ADHD as a badge of honour and say it's a superpower and all of this stuff. And I kind of get that argument, but also I, I just, I think that I look at the challenges I've had with it and I wish that I would have been medicated sooner because let, let's be honest, the kid who left school at 15, let alone the stuff I was getting up to both in and out of school at that time of my life. Um, I look at, you know, all of the personal challenges I've had along the way and which could have been driven by the challenges there. I look at the binge eating where, you know, dopamine hunting because um, ADHD is a result of your brain not produce. I think it produces but doesn't pick up on the dopamine. Um, I don't know the science of it, but it's something to do with dopamine. 
so you indulge in dopamine hunting, which is why there's a higher propensity to become stuck into some really bad places around gambling, drugs, crime and so on. For me, luckily, I had the mild version of those, which was binge eating and online shopping. Um, you know, and I, I see it now, you know, I have, my, I have to put my phone downstairs because the tablets take about an hour to kick in. And I will order some random crap off Amazon. <laughs> you know, you wouldn't believe the stuff that would come in. Well, I'm just searching for that little high before the tablet comes in. But I went through 13 years of it, and I'm actually quite ashamed of a lot of the downsides of it. And this is the bit that people don't really talk about. They talk about ADHD. You know, the bad bit is, oh, you lose your keys a few times. And yeah, you do. I've left a 70 grand car running with the doors open outside a petrol garage a couple of times. I've travelled abroad without my wallet. Um, there's, in fact, there's a, a, an amusing story about Les Ferdinand buying me a coffee at Paris or the airport. And somehow I came back from my trip to Paris without my wallet or my wash bag with perfectly clean, having had a really nice meal out at a mission style restaurant and 20 euros in my pocket. I don't know how that <laughs> happened. But, you know, I'd, I've travelled countless times without my stuff. Um, I would leave the office back when I was in the office and then go back in to get my wallet, I'd then go back out, get to my car, I'll go back and get my keys. This wasn't just once, this was four times out of five. It was regular. And the challenges that I found from it, um, from the ADHD and it not being medicated, it really has been transformative, getting that stuff sorted. So that would be the first thing I would say, is make sure that you, um, if you think you need help, Make sure you get the help and it's it's not bad to take tablets. They won't take anything away from you. Actually, it will help um, it will help you cope with the bad sides. Okay. The um, it's interesting where you talk about historically they're just picking up on that. Um, I um, on a different perspective, I was asked a question once, you know, what um, is there anything you regret about um, part the past mm. um, and my answer was personally that there's things that would be nice not to have happened yeah but I wouldn't change any of absolutely it right because it's created the person I am today it's part of your fabric it's yeah. like you know those um, you know uh, patchworks yeah. it, it's kind of that I think the second thing is to uh, and this one might be tough for those going through sort of acute issues right now. Because I'm again, I'm really conscious that mental health covers everything from yeah. PTSD, um, which is sort of longer term, and obviously lifelong neurodiversity right the way through to very acute challenges right now that could be a really deep, deep yeah. but um, relatively um, narrow depressive period. So I get that there's a whole host of things. But I think it's really important, linked to number one, to understand the impact you have on other people. Okay, and I think that whilst we're in a world where we can talk about how we're feeling and we can talk about, you know, we can openly, you know, blokes talking about mental health was unheard of, you know, like five, ten years ago. Um, we openly talk about it, and that's to be welcomed, but we talk about the impact on ourselves and we need to actually explore the um, impact on other people as well. So it was actually my son Junior that uh, pushed me towards medication and seeing his challenges, uh, but also the impact he has on the family. So Junior is, is a remarkable little kid. He's really happy, so I don't know how he's happy because he's gonna kill me when he grows up um, if he ever gets hold of this. You know, he's six, he's not talking, he's in nappies, he's got some real, um, real challenges in life, you know, global development delays. Um, he's going to have difficulties in his life going forwards. Um, but he was diagnosed with autism at the age of about 18 to 21 months. It was sort of at the late part of being one coming up to two. And many people might think that's really too early and you can't tell, but maybe it's a self-fulfilling prophecy, but he, yeah, it's kind of clear that that's where he's at and um, that's what he's picked up so early. We found out because he wasn't turning his head. So he wasn't recognizing his name. Me being me, I took the rather blunt approach of testing his hearing. Well, I'm going to the doctors, I got a saucepan and a metal spoon, whacked it, and he didn't flinch. I then, you know, put on some music really loudly in the car, he didn't flinch. It was like, he's deaf. So we went, went all the tests, went through, um, we were getting primed, and we're getting all the leaflets and so on about cochlear implants. 
So we thought we had a child who was deaf and then it just so happened they sedated him and this was the last test before they started doing the um, cochlear implants. They sedated him, put him onto loads of scans. They said, well, his ears are receiving the noise perfectly fine. It's something to do with the link between the ear and the brain. Um, and that was when we went on the autism journey. But what's become clear, and unfortunately with the challenges of private diagnosis only being done virtually at the moment, um, they've, you know, like a lot of businesses, they've seen the cost savings of doing things over Zoom. Um, that's a whole other story. And if you're doing stuff only by Zoom, get out, start shaking people's hands, it's a lot better. Um, a combination of that and the NHS waiting list, we're stuck in a, a tricky place with the ADHD. So it's not formally diagnosed because they can't start that process until they turn six. But the paediatrician has said that it's almost certain that he's ADHD. He just needs to go through the process so that the paediatrician can sign it off. And seeing the impact that his, his ways and his actions have on the family, I saw a lot of the stuff that I was doing and the impact I was having on the family. So I think that would be, I guess, advice number two. So number one, if you need help, get the help. Number two, be really mindful of the impact you have on other people. You might not be able to change stuff, but you might be able to have the open conversations about why you're doing certain things and reassuring your family and so on that it's, it's not them, it's you. And you, you, know, you can make that whole situation a whole lot easier. Tip number three that I would give is... I think embrace the cards you've been dealt with and that goes for anything in life, doesn't it? You know, if you, um, you know, in life we're all given a deck of cards and we've got some good cards, we've got some bad cards. You know, we can look at ourselves and, you know, I, I could certainly look at myself and think, why didn't I have an upbringing like Ben in a nice big house and cash to invest in a business? Because I could have done this, this and this. Um, but then again, I could look at 99% of the world, you know, and look at how it could have been. Um, there's always challenges and yes, we've all got some um, things that hold us back in life, um, but we've also got things that have given us a unintended sort of leg up in life as well. And it's not as simple as the way that it's often communicated. So often we think of, um, you know, we think of equality as you know, black, white, male, female, gay, straight, etc., etc., and we look at it from a quite a binary perspective. And my eyes were opened up to this by a diversity speaker who um, who said to me that you know the common narrative. Yeah, you know, he was saying so. He said the common narrative is Jamaican. He said the common narrative is, but I'm behind because I'm black. But actually, I'm over six foot tall. Okay, that's something I can't help. But it's actually an advantage in the corporate world because of the promotions and CEO level. I'm male, etc. And it was like this whole matrix. And I realized that actually, it's not just about, you know, my fact that I had a deprived upbringing, that's not just a bad card in the world against me. It's actually the whole deck of cards. And you need to understand where you are, not take advantage of it. You know, you're not, you don't cheat and try and shuffle the pack, but you just play your cards as best you can. And a great book for that is a book by Hassan Kuba, I think it is, and Ash Ali, The Unfair Advantage. Because we've all got an unfair advantage somewhere, even if it is, but we have to think outside the box to understand where it is. And from a neurodiversity and mental health perspective, that unfair advantage is something that we need to understand, embrace, and make the most of. Because neurodiversity in particular, the fact that we think differently, it might be seen as a disadvantage to society, but actually it's a huge advantage. Um, hopefully, like I'm doing in what is a very non-ADHD world in accountancy, it helps me stand out. That's great. Last one, if anybody would like to work with you, Carl, how would they find you? Oh, wow, good question. So I'm a social media whore, but I'm dreadful at responding to messages. So social media is the best place. I know place. that, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> so social media is the best place, but um, obviously with the way that all of the bots and so on work, it's a really bad place to try and get hold of me. Um, so the best way, if anyone would like to chat to me, so look, I'm not, I'm not here punting for business, not here yeah. punting for conversations and all of that stuff. But if anyone wants to contact me, um, interaction on social media is good because I see comments and so on. The, the messages just get lost with all of the random DMs and so on. And I, unfortunately, I, ha I now have to set filters up to divert a lot of them as well. 
Um, so they, or if they want to contact me directly, it will actually be via Sarah, who is um, not only my wonderful wife, but my chief organiser, and they can do that through my website, carlbeater.com. Brilliant. Thank you very much for coming in, Carl. It's been great chatting to you. Brilliant. Thanks, Richard. I hope you enjoyed watching this interview. Please remember to hit subscribe and like. It really helps us with the algorithms for YouTube, and I'll look forward to bringing you more interviews in the next episode of Drive, the small business podcast from UKBF.